craving to get out. So we'll, uh, we'll commence right away. We're still in 1 Samuel. So if you could turn in your Bibles or whatever device you have. And I'm going to be fighting this thing the whole time. So I guess you're going to have to get used to it. I, I think maybe what I need is some of that cosmetic tape and just tape it to my face or something. It's kind of what I need. We are going to uh, be teaching today uh, from uh, 1 Samuel, the 26th and the 27th chapter. So I've got two chapters to cover. It makes it a, a, a challenge. And uh, I titled this teaching, enemy of, The Enemy of My Enemy. But before we commence on chapter 26, I want to revisit a couple of things from chapter 25, uh, where we dealt with the death of Samuel and the conflict with Nabal. So first, we will discover that this is the last time that, uh, this is not the last time that we hear from Samuel. So stay tuned for coming chapters, because we're going to hear from Samuel again, even though he was given uh, just one verse uh, saying that he died. And uh, we should be reminded of a couple of facts. Psalm 116.15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Uh, we look upon death uh, often in, in many cases for the world. Death is indeed a tragic thing because there is no more chance in order to... Uh, put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and partake of the, uh, the benefit that he provided for us. And so, yes, that's a very sad thing when uh, someone who is steeped in the world and has not uh, yielded to Christ Jesus, who is the only way to God. Uh, but for us who are in Christ Jesus, it's, uh, there's a sadness in parting. Uh, just a, a month and a half ago, I had to say goodbye to my younger brother. And, uh, but I, uh, I don't grieve forever because I'll see him again. It's kind of like uh, David, you remember, uh, or we'll see it as we go into further chapters. Remember David fell into sin with Bathsheba and, and uh, a little child was born. And the result of the sin was is that the child would die. And David went and he pled with God. He cried, he rent his hair, he, he you know, put sackcloth and ashes on, and he was beside himself to try to save the life of the child. But the moment the child died, you remember, he immediately got up, cleaned himself, said, bring me some food. And they said, well, how can you do this? He said, I'll go to him. I will go to him. So there is a place uh, for all of us in that way. Also, I want to uh, point out in regard to life eternal that <clears throat> Jesus reassures us in Matthew 22, verse 31, and he's quoting, Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting from Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. And the Sadducees had come to him, and as you remember, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. It's just like there are many churches across the face of America today where men are standing in the pulpit who don't believe what they're preaching. They don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They don't, there's all kinds of things that they don't believe, and yet they want to hold forth. You know, And that's the way the Sadducees were. They were religious people, but we just don't believe it. And so they came to him, and like a lot of people do, they put forth a straw man. They give a scenario that just flat out isn't going to happen and want to see if Jesus can answer the puzzle. And of course, he answered, he says, you err because you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. And he finally got down to the uh, 31st verse and he said, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you? By the way, let's take a little parenthetical stop there. Every time we open the word of God, whether it's digital, I've got it right here on my iPad, and I can carry it in my iPhone, or if it's analog, you're carrying a Bible with you at all times. Every time you open it, God is speaking to us. God is speaking to us. This is his word. And so he says, don't you know, uh, haven't you read that which was spoken unto you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, 
but of the living. Samuel does not enter into nothingness. He extends even to this day. And by the way, God judges time. He's only been gone for three days. So it's no big deal there. Secondly, I want to deal with one of David's wives. And we're going to deal with polygamy later on uh, as we go because the the last verse of the 25th chapter dealt with these different wives that uh, David had. And Ahinoam, uh, was the first one listed as the, uh, 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 in the succession of his wife. They listed Ahinoam, and then they listed uh, Abigail, which is Abigail is her name, but uh, uh, Abigail. And then they also listed uh, uh, Michal, uh, Michal, who uh, Saul has taken away from David. And later on, David's going to take her back. And then, of course, later he had a fourth wife. He did marry Bathsheba, who was involved in, in his sin. And so uh, they listed here Ahinoam, and she is listed in chapter 14 in the 50th verse as being the wife of Saul. And so often one king would raid the harem of another, but we simply don't know how she came to be David's wife. And you know there are gaps in the historical narrative, and they're there for a reason. I have sojourned on this world for 27,648 days. And I, every one of those days, something happened to me. And if I were to commence to tell you what happened to me each day of those 26,648 days, there's no doubt in my mind that the Rome would start to dissipate and Everyone would politely excuse themselves because there was some previous thing that they had forgotten about and had to be taken care of. And so that's kind of the way it is with the details of the Bible. Uh, we, we just have to know that everything cannot be recorded. That's what John said. Remember the last, the last chapter, the last verse of the book of, of John? in John 21, 25, and he says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. There just wouldn't be room enough for it. So that's why there's gaps in these things, and they hit the high points, and sometimes they'll hit the high points a couple of times, as we'll see today, but we have to know that the gaps are there. One of the life lessons of today's passage, I'd like for us all to walk away with a, a life lesson. And one of the life lessons is how should we react to the stress of trouble? Is there anybody out here who has not had any trouble ever? Louise, you're the only one. You're, you're in a class all by yourself. It must be lonely out there, <laughs> really. Uh, now, we all have trouble and tribulation, don't we? No one should think by coming to Christ that they are going to have some kind of a good luck charm that is going to keep them from having to uh, experience the difficulties that come to us in life. And some of those difficulties are large. Some, some of them are just annoying. But they all come. There is all this trouble that comes to us and we should expect nothing else. John, once again, in chapter 21, or pardon me, in uh, chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said these words. He said, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. And boy, that's the only place where we have peace is when we get ourselves grounded and we say, oh, wait a second, God's got this under control. And we turn ourselves back to peace. He says, in the world ye shall have tribulation." It's just going to happen, folks, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So today, knowing that we are going to have trouble in and out of all the days of our life, that's what we're seeing in the experience of David. My goodness, the constant trouble 
and turmoil that he is having to endure at this time. And how did he react? I'll tell you how he reacted. He sat down and he said, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied with, as with marrow and fatness in my mouth, shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. That was David's reaction. That stands as an example for you and I. Refer back to it, Psalm 63, when life presses in on you. Let's commence on chapter 26, where the stool pigeons come out of the underbrush, and they come to Saul. The Ziphites came unto Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hakalah, which is before Jeshimon? Then Saul rose, and he went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men. He just got through doing this some short time ago. I don't know how much space is between the last journey and this one, but it certainly wasn't enough. And he gets those same 3,000 men. He's going with overwhelming force. He's going to have shock and awe when he gets there. David has accumulated 600 misfits to follow him. Saul brings an army of 3,000. They almost got David the last time. He just escaped barely the last time, only because God stepped in and stirred up the Philistines to go and attack, and Saul had to pull away and go fight the Philistines. His mortal enemy, he spent his whole uh, uh, kingdom, uh, uh, time as king, he, he sought fighting the Philistines. It says, and Saul uh, uh, pitched in the hill of Hakalah, which is just before Jeshimon, by the way. But, David abode in the wilderness, so David is hiding there, lurking there, going out in the forest and behind the rocks and whatnot, and they've got lookouts everywhere, and they know that, oh, the army's moving, it's coming down. And he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. Verse 4 says, David therefore sent out spies. And then he understood, they get their spies crawling around, and they understood that Saul was come in very deed, that he was in there. It wasn't just his army, but Saul was there also. Verse 5 says, And David arose, and he came to the place where Saul was pitched. They had made camp. And I don't know that he had a tent. He's just made camp there. It says, And David beheld the place where Saul lay. So he's close enough that he can see. It was a lot harder then in those days because nobody had come up with a set of binoculars. And so you had to get a lot closer if you're going to see what the enemy is doing. So it's a, a lot trickier. You know, warfare has gotten so much easier. Yeah. Uh, we now can fight wars. Some guy in Arizona is watching a screen and he's got his joystick like that, and there's a drone over Afghanistan that's flying along. They find their target like that, and they drop a Hellfire missile, missile on it, and they're obliterated. And we think, oh, that's so much easier. Well, we'll see how much easier it is, because we keep creating worse and worse things to try to attack one another. It's part of the fallen nature of man. And so now, not only do we have arsenals of nuclear weapons that can annihilate millions of people at a time, 
but we find that the wizards of SMART are even right now working in labs and they're just so thrilled because they found a way to really enhance the coronavirus even more and make it so it's 80% deadly instead of 4% deadly. All we can do is pray, come quickly Lord Jesus because we are our own worst enemy. So David sneaks in there. They get close enough that they know exactly where he's laying, and he can see where Saul is, and Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench. The King James says he lays in the trench. Now, he doesn't mean that he's laying in a ditch. This actually should be better uh, translated as... Uh, as in a, um, an entrenchment, and it's like circling the wagons. They've made a safe perimeter, and they're in the center of that area. And the people pitched round about him, so the whole army is there, and they're up there close looking at this. It says, then answered David uh, to Ahimelech the Hittite. You remember there was a priest, the chief priest also had the name uh, Ahimelech, and, but this is Ahimelech the Hittite, not to be confused with the priest. And to uh, Abisai, the son of Zeruiah, who is the brother of Joab, or Joab as we would say, and these are the characters that we are going to recognize, we're going to see uh, later on as the story unfolds ahead, as the history is revealed. These are people that, names that are going to come up again, David, Abisai, and Joab and Abner, and uh, they're, they're key players. And so he says to Abisai, the son of Zer Zeruiah, the brother of Joab, saying, who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abisai said, I will go down with thee. So he's quick. He's ready to go. He's not as quick as his younger brother, Ahasahel, who we'll find about later on. But uh, he's, he's quick, he volunteers, and so they're going to go down. So David and Abisai came to the people by night. And behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, in the center of all of this area, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. Now, that would be his pillow, but the, actually the word that is uh, translated here would be, better mean to say at his head, because I don't know that he was out there carrying a pillow. I know there were times uh, after that where, you know, generals and kings and all that, they lived different than you and I. I think at the time we went to uh, see San Simeon, which is down on the coast of California. It's one of the five homes that uh, William Randolph Hearst built. And he built San Simeon, which overlooks the ocean. It's up, uh, up the hill. It's about 1,700 feet above sea level there. And it's a magnificent structure. And he built it to uh, house his Greek artwork, Greek and Mediterranean or something like that. You know, so I, the house was designed around the, all the artwork that's in it. And the reason he built it on that place is because as a child, that's where they camped. And he enjoyed going up there to camp. And the way the Hearst would camp, because William Randolph's father is the one that became rich. George became rich. He uh, struck it rich in the silver mines. And so he went back home and he married the girl who was from the other side of the tracks. He was from the wrong side of the tracks. She was from the right side of the tracks. But when he went back, it's amazing what having millions of dollars in your pocket will do. And so he was able to marry her, and their son was William Randolph. And he said they used to go camping up there. And the way they would camp is they would have the servants carry the big tent, the 1,700 feet up there. And they would lay down the Persian rugs, and they'd put in the overstuffed chairs and all that, and then they would go up there and they would look at the view and all that, and that was roughing it for them. And so there are generals and kings who did travel that way, but I don't think at this point in life and in the development of civilization that Saul was doing that. I think they all were pretty tough people. I have often admired my brother-in-law, Gwen's youngest brother, who he used to, now he's too old to do it, now he's got a camper and he takes the camper out to go camping and hunting, he's a hunter. But it used to be, he'd put a blanket on his back rolled up and a little backpack with a few things in it and have his gun or his bow and arrow, whatever he did, and he would hike out into the woods and he'd be gone for 30 days. And then he would come back with a trophy in, in 
hand. There was a time when he was 20 for 22. So in 22 years, he got 20 elk. So now he, uh, uh, he's someone worthy of our respect. It's worthy of all the hunter's respect. And so I'm thinking, now that's a real camper. Just go out there with a blanket. You make your own shelter. He makes his own fire. He catches his own food and, and all. And, and uh, that's a hunter. Well, that's the way these people went to war. You know, they were carrying their own stuff. And they didn't carry a whole lot of extra. And there was no Columbia Sportswear and Nike to provide them with the proper kind of outdoor gear. So it was a whole different way of fighting for them. And there is Saul, he lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear is stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. So he's in this whole crowd. Now, I have said before, and I'll say again, this is all like a TV program, folks. How it all lines out. This is the plot for every Western that's out there. And so here's the cowboys, all of Saul and his crew, and here's the Indians, David and his crew. And you've seen it a bunch of times. In the middle of the night, all the cowboys are asleep. The fire is dying out in the middle. And the horses are all tied up over here. And the Indians sneak in, wearing their moccasins. And they let the horses go. And they go, ha, ah, ah, ha, scare them all away. And then leaves the cowboys stranded high and dry. Well, that's what's going on here. David and Abbasi, they come right into the camp. And all these guys are sleeping. Not a good thing. Uh, armies have become better developed now, and they, this wouldn't be happening. By the time the Roman legions came around, this wouldn't be happening at all. But it was happening there. It says, Then said Abbasay to David, God hath delivered thine... Oh, he's saying it quietly, though. I, but so you can hear me in the back, I'm just going to say it in a normal voice, but he's whispering. Okay. And he says, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now, therefore, let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear, even to the earth at once. And I will not smite him again. I won't smite him a second time. It's only going to take one thing. I can put him down. Let me do it, David. Let me do it. Come on, let me go. This is the eagerness and the inexperience of youth. In... Uh, I want to go to Psalm 119 and uh, see if I'm in the right place. Oh, here we go. Psalm uh, 100 and... Uh, 119, there we go, 99 and 100. He says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That we want to obtain wisdom. The first thing is to draw close to God and to get to know his word and how he's speaking to us. And as we do that, more and more, we gain wisdom. But you know, there's also a certain amount of wisdom that's gained by the experience of older people. I encourage younger ones whether you are young in age and inexperienced, I mean, there's a few in here, or if you are young in the Lord and inexperienced, seek to attach yourself to someone who is more experienced. Make a friendship. Find someone who can mentor you and can help you to curb your impulses. Job said it another way in uh, Job 32, verses 7 and 9. He said, I said days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in a man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. It has to do with who we yield our lives to. Just what kind of wisdom we attain. But I can think of times when I've been eager to do something and someone who knew better said, well, no, 
you better do this first and then this and then this. Otherwise, this will happen. Now, oh, I hadn't even thought of that. And it's that way spiritually too. Because a lot of times, even when we come to Christ, the old man rears its ugly head. And our first inclination is often the wrong inclination. And it takes a lot of training. It takes a lifetime of training, walking in the ways of God, to be able to yield in wisdom and do things the right way. David speaks up. And I'm so impressed with the character of King David. What a man. He is at the apex of ethics. He could have given in. I mean, here we are. It's deja vu all over again. This is the same thing that was happening just weeks ago. He went through a similar scenario. Remember, he was hiding in the cave, and Saul decided he wanted to take a nap, and he comes into the cave, and he's at the mouth of the cave, and David and his other men are deep in the cave, hunkered down, and Saul falls asleep right there. And they say, well, <laughs> this is it. Let's kill him. And David says, no, no, no. We're not going to do this. This is the Lord's anointed. But he did go in and cut the skirt of his robe off. And you remember that when Saul went out of the cave and got a distance away, that David stood out there and said, hey, you left something behind. And they had this interchange, and, and, and it's almost exactly the same interchange that we're going to see here again. And David, as a, a man, he, he has the knowledge that he is the one that's going to be the next king of Israel. It's been told to him. Samuel uh, anointed him to be the next king of Israel. And yet he is content to be number two. I was remarking about this to Pastor Anthony the other day. We were talking about some you know, people who have been number two and then situations go wrong because they desire so strongly to be number one. And... Uh, and I think that's one of the things that really impressed me about David and Jonathan. Is that both of them are perfectly content to be number two. David does not want to depose Saul. God will take care of that. And Jonathan, he doesn't cling to the idea of being king. He recognizes that David is the better man to do it. And he is prepared and has stated that he's willing to be second in command. So David could, at this point, say, just out of exasperation, say, oh my goodness, how many times do I have to go through this with you? And say, you know what? We're just going to put an end to this. I have to say, go there, run a spear through him. All would have been over. And he could have taken his place. But he's, at the, he's such an ethical man. And so he says, the Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. This is verse 11. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. So they sneak over and they climb over the bodies and in between everybody. And he gets down there and he pulls the spear out of the ground and he grabs his water bottle. And then he has to go and turn like this and sneak back over the bodies that are there in order to get out of the camp. How could he do that? And David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster and they get them away and no man saw it nor knew it, neither awaked, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. Now, I don't know about you, but I love it when I have a deep sleep that endures for an entire night, and when I do, I know that's from the Lord. Because usually it's up at least two or three times, and uh, it's just, you don't sleep the whole night through like you used to. But here's a whole army, 3,000 men spread all over the ground, and they're all sleeping like babies. God says, Lullaby and good night. And they all went.
went to sleep. That alone, ladies and gentlemen, 3,000 people, that alone is a miracle. So we get to the 13th verse, uh, <clears throat> and we get the uh, taunt that uh, David does. It says, then David went over to the other side, and he stood on top of a hill, and he was afar off. He made sure he w- there was a great space between them. And David cried to the people, Wake up! It says, And David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that criest to the king? And David said to Abner, Art not thou a valiant man? And who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there is come one of the people in to destroy the king of thy Lord. This thing is not a good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because you have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see here, the king's spear is, and the cruise of water that was at his bolster. And they're all looking around like, how did that happen? How did he get in here? Verse 17, it says, and Saul knew David's voice, and he said, remember, we've been here before. Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, it is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, wherefore doth my lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in mine hand? Now, therefore, I pray thee, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, For the king of Israel is come out to seek a flea, as one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains. I am of no harm or danger to you. Why are you doing this to me? I'm just a flea. I am insignificant. I am not going to hurt you. And he's proven it now. Several times. Because he certainly could have. And then we get the same old insincere, phony apology. And the only reason we know it's apology because he says it good and it sounds good. But he said it over and over and over again. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm. Sounds like Wiley E. Coyote, doesn't it? I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. I don't know if I can say that any more insincerely than I am. Saul is not a man who has any integrity. He has no ethics. He's an insecure and and he's selfish. He's mean-spirited. He's impulsive. He makes decisions that are harmful and, and then is too proud to change his direction. He is absolutely 180 degrees different than David is. That's why David is the man after God's own heart. David. He's he's sensitive, he's caring, he's courageous, he's, he's teachable, he's all of these good qualities, everything that Saul is not. And he expresses it in verse 22. This is the power of a clean conscience. 
He says, And David answered and said, Behold, the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. He's not even going to take it. I'm going to give it back to you. You can have the spear. And he says, The Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord. And let him deliver me out of all tribulation. He is willing to let Saul live out his life, naturally. In fact, somehow I, I missed a, a short chunk of the scripture up here when he was talking to um, Abisai uh, up in the 10th verse. He says, we're, we're not going to touch the Lord's anointed and uh, no one can uh, stretch forth their hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. And I overlooked the 10th verse and it says, and David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him or his day shall come to die or he shall descend into battle and perish. That final day comes to every one of us. Yeah. And perhaps Saul is going to do something that's so egregious that God just sends down a bolt of lightning from heaven and strikes him dead on the spot. And that's not beyond the realm of possibility. Remember when the children of Israel had that little uh, set to out in the desert and there was a rebellion and, and all that? And, and Moses said, okay, uh, we'll have this. All these people get on this side and you people get over on that side. And says, and then the Lord did a new thing. And the earth opened up and swallowed them. And they were gone. You know, God might smite us. God might smite the nation. Heaven knows we deserve to be smitten. We have reached a point in our culture where it is absolutely the way the Bible says, where people are saying that good is bad and bad is good. And everything that is vile is being normalized. And we're being told, no, you can't just tolerate it. Before, it was for a while you tolerate it, but now, no, you must embrace it. You must embrace it. There are people at the door that are banging at the door saying, give us those men that we might know them. It's happening in our nation. We are seeing our culture crumble around us. The things that we hold dear and say that these are sacrosanct and they're doing everything they can to try to do away with them. And soon the troops will turn to us. It's happening in different ways. You know, you just try to speak truth on Facebook. is isn't going to happen. You'll disappear. You know, you'll, it's as if you were never there. Twitter, it's as if you were never there. You're gone. And one day the day will come when they will come and make us physically disappear. They'll start taking people and they just, you won't hear about them anymore. That's how they did it in China. That's how Mao did it. And that's how you're going to see Xi do it. Because Xi is now in the same position as Mao. He's got another five years of leadership and he is talking already of taking back Taiwan and we know that they want to overpower and take the United States of America because they want to be number one. And the only reason we in the United States of America are number one because we are founded on the principles of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is the one who established this nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it can all change, and deservedly so. Or we might just die of natural causes. Pretty soon we just get so old and worn out that it's a, it's a relief to finally close our eyes for a nap and wake up in heaven. And that's a good thing. Or perhaps we do have to go into battle. We do actually have to do something because uh, sometimes we're called to do stuff like that. And when you do, there's a chance that you'll perish in that battle. And it's a, it's a noble thing that people are willing to do that to serve their, their nation. The people. I was thinking the other day, you know, uh, what tremendous training it takes and what uh, great 
guys these are who join the Secret Service and protect the president. They'll, you know, if the shooting starts, they throw their bodies over the president in order to protect. They're going to take the slug instead of the president. You think that takes a special kind of human being to be able to do that sort of thing. We may be called to, to fight, and if we do, we may perish in battle. Who knows? Verse 25 says, Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things and also shalt still prevail. So David went his way and Saul returned to his place. That was truth spoken in empty words. He didn't mean them, but they were certainly true. Because David would prevail and David would do great things. But David is a man who dwells in the land of reality. And this is a good place for us to always dwell. A lot of times people want to dwell in the land of hopefulness. You know, or pretend. Or how we want it to be. But it's always good for us to be rooted in how it actually is. And David, seeing things as they really are, says in his heart, verse 1 of chapter 27, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. I will one day be consumed by this man. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of, of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. And David arose and he passed over with the 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Maok, the king of Gath. Been here before, haven't we? Only that last time that we were here, you remember David escaped by the hair of his chinny-chin-chin, and he just barely got out of town with his life, and he ran to Achish by himself. And when he got there, he heard the murmurings of Achish's men saying, whoa, whoa, isn't this David, the new king? You know, already the rumor is going around. The enemy knows, oh, this David, the guy who killed our, our Goliath. You know, he's now here. Isn't this the one that the girls were all singing about? It was a very popular song. All the girls are singing it about Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. And David said, uh-oh, not so good. And so he started making like he was a madman. He's drooling all over his beard and he's rubbed himself with dirt and he's scratching on the wall and he's saying gibberish. And Akish says, don't we have enough madmen? I don't need one of these in my palace. You know, just send him away. Send him away. And they did. Now David returns. And he comes to Akish. He says, Akish, my lord. Now I want you to remember that he comes to Akish, but he's got 600 guys standing behind him this time. <laughs> so there's not this eagerness to uh, punish him for what he did to Goliath. And it says... Uh, it says he arose, he passed over with 600 men that were with him unto Achish, and David dwelt with Achish at Gath. So, and we don't see there's a gap here. He comes, and obviously everything got worked out. He talked it over with uh, Achish, and uh, and he's living with Achish. He and his men, every man with his household. So all the men have their wives and their kids and their things and their stuff. And David is there uh, with his two wives, Ahinoam, uh, the Jezreelitess, and uh, Abigail, the Carmelitess, the Baal's wife. And it was told so that David had fled to Gath. And he says, oh, well, we won't chase him anymore. You know. So now he finally gives up, but it's certainly not because of the word that he gave just a few sentences ago. It's because he sees, well, oh, this is kind of fruitless. I'm not going to be able to get in there. I'd spend all my time fighting the Philistines as it is, and I'd, it's just not going to happen. And verse 5 says, you know, some more time goes by, and David said to Achish, If I have now found grace in thine eyes, let let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why, should I, why, for why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? You know, there's only Rome and town for too many, and it's your town. Why don't you give me another place to go? I, I've 
imposed on you enough. Uh, it's been uh, too long of a time, and I'm smelling like old fish. So give me a town that I can go to. And it says, and then Akish gave him Ziklag that day. Now, Ziklag was right on the border between Judah and Gath. It's a, a few miles east of Gath. And so it was right just this side of the border. But as we see in the last part of this verse, that it, from then on, it became on that side of the border. It says, he gave him Ziklag that day, wherefore Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. You know, they're speaking, this happened years ago, you know, and that's why we have Ziklag now, because Akish made the mistake of giving it to David, and he kept it. It says, then the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months, almost a year and a half he's there. This much time went on in just a few sentences. It says, Verse 8, and it says, And David and his men went up, and they invaded the Geshurites and the Gezrites and the Malachites. For those nations were of old the inhabitants of the land. As thou goest to Shur, which is even further south. So if you're going way down, Shur is the wilderness area that is there just before you go into Egypt. So it's quite a ways down in the south. And all of these people are wandering in these areas. They're nomadic people now, but they've been driven out of other parts of Israel. They've come from further north. And some of them are aligned with Akish. And uh, so they go out there. And you'll remember that the children of Israel came in to take the land. They were given instructions. They were allowed to go into the land because the sin of the inhabitants of the land had finally reached the point where God is going to deal with it. And the way he's dealing with it, he says, here are the instructions. You go in there and you completely annihilate the people. Sin pays a wage. Sin always pays a wage. And the wage of sin is death. And that was the wage that was to be paid. And the children of Israel were to do that. And they did not and so some of the people are now nomadic and they've escaped and they're down there. So here's David down in this southern area and he decides to, he's going to finish off the job and he goes and he attacks these people. And he says, and David smote the land and he left neither man nor woman alive. He killed all the adults. And he took away the sheep and the oxen and the asses and the camels and the apparel and he returned and he came to Achish. He comes back with his troops and they're just laden down with goods, what they're doing. And so verse 10, Achish said, hey, what's up? That's essentially what he's saying. He says, whither have you made a road today? And David said, against the south of Judah and against the south of the Judah, Jeremiahites and against the south of the Kenites. And David, as you said in the previous verse, David saved neither man nor woman alive to bring tidings to Gath, saying, lest they should tell on us, saying, so did David, and so will be his manner all the while he dwelleth in the country of the Philistines. He didn't want those people coming back and giving Achish a report, saying, you know what? This is what David has done to us, and this is what David is going to do to you. Because David is there simply to escape Saul. He's with the enemy of his enemy. And he kind of, he doesn't lie. He just doesn't quite tell him the truth. Oh, yeah, I was down here at the south, the south of the Kenites and the Jehemelites and, and down there the south of Judah, and and Akish, he wants to believe what he wants to believe. And he's saying, oh, right. He's down there fighting his own people. And he says in his heart, he says, Akish believed David. Uh, Akish believed David, the last verse, 12th verse. And he hath made his people Israel utterly to abhor him. Therefore, he shall be my servant forever. 
He deludes himself. He wants to believe this. And so he does. The old saying is that the enemy of, the, of my enemy is a friend. Saul's just told him a lie. He was down there in the south. This is the same thing I tell all the Californians. You move here to, uh, to Oregon, and people say, where are you from? You tell them, I'm from a little south of Lapine. You know, you're telling them the truth. And we Oregonians, we want to believe that. And so it's good. And Akish wants to believe it, and he does. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. You know what? A lot of times the enemy of your enemy is still your enemy. And both of these men, both Saul and Akish, are pawns in the hands of Satan. They're being used for his purpose in the great war against God. And the war rages on, even today. We need to be wise. We need to be responsive as David was. We need to be people willing to get on our knees and say, Oh, Lord, you are my Lord. Thus will I praise you. I'll lift my hands to you. We need to follow hard after God, for his right hand upholds us. Lord God, your ways are beyond our imaginations. I, when we see it put down here in black and white, and we, we read about it, now we kind of understand it, but it's certainly not the way we probably would have responded. We'd probably be like the young and eager one saying, let me do God's work. But Lord, you are big enough and great enough that you can do your own work. And I thank you, Lord, that you have done that work in our hearts. And I pray that we would be as David, that we would have our hearts set on you, and that we would follow hard after you as the week unfolds before us. Lord, you to be praised, honored, and glorified. And we do so. In Christ Jesus' name, amen.